Today's message is real friends are forever. Real friends are forever. I got this definition for friendship and I adapted it a little. A friend is one who multiplies joys. Shall we say together? Multiplies joys, divides grief, adds loyalty and subtracts flattery. That's the full cause on arithmetic. Okay? Multiplies joys, divides grief, adds loyalty, and subtracts flattery. So there's friendship with marriage, obviously, isn't it? We marry as friends and we become better friends. So turn to your wife and say, over the years we have become much better friends than on the day we married. Then every father waits for the day your son becomes your friend. Every mother waits for the day your daughter becomes your friend. Isn't it? What a wonderful day when you your cares, on the things that hurt you, you can share with your son. It's real friendship. It talks of a lifetime of investment now bringing dividends. And if a son comes into fatherhood with business and what he has labored all his life, he is able to emote the son with a golden handshake, not in the normal way we understand golden handshake where we say, okay, you have been useful, now we want to see the back of you, not like that. A real golden handshake, saying, son, this is what I labored for, I can give it to you, knowing that you will increase this. Do you understand that? So we look forward to the day of our own children become our friends. That's it. We ought to say, hip hip hura for that. That would be the culmination of parenting that we did last time. Then we can be friends to even our boss. Because even seniors need friends. Is it? To someone who sees. You can be friend to your spiritual father. I mean friends. Thank you and you have been there. I like most to be with you, you know that. Then you can be friends to juniors and mentor them, model what you have learned. So friendships go all across. Certainly, you can be friends with your own age group. So I like you to I like you to look in the direction of your best friend if that best friend is here. Are you looking around to see whether did you look at your best friend? Was she far away? No, she was right by your side. Okay. I hope no one fell into that trap. Uh, so this is about friendship. Now, I like to read to you from Psalms, uh, Proverbs 25, 19. How many of you have had a bad tooth without knowing? What's the difference between a bad tooth that you know is bad and a bad tooth that you don't know is bad? What's the difference? When you know you have a bad tooth, you are not going to bite meat on that side. You bite meat on the other side. But sometimes the tooth, uh, the, the enamel begins to erode and the root canal gets exposed one day and you take some ice cream and on that day you see hell. Now Proverbs say, Proverbs 25, 19, like a bad tooth and an unsteady foot, is confidence in a faithless man in time of trouble. Bad foot and, and those of you have had a bad, bad knee recently, you know what it is about. When an unsteady foot, 
So we don't we want to have friends who are steady, especially in a time of trouble. I like to read five qualities of a friend that comes from ideal friend. Will you say the ideal friend? Now there's one perfect friend. Unfortunately or fortunately he's in heaven. And we together all try to get together and emulate him. And hopefully when 100 people get together, they can add up to being a friend like Jesus. What is it? Or maybe if 1,000 Christians get together, they can they can add up to be like Jesus. So we have only one faithful, one perfect friend who is our great, great friend, the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves at all times, sees me through. Before my problem comes, he sees it. And he loves me through and through. Now, we would like to emulate that kind of friendship. A friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. Proverbs 17, 17. That's easy to remember. When scriptures have the same number, verse and chapter, it's easy to remember. So here is a scripture that is easy to remember. 17, 17. Proverbs, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. Uh, Proverbs 18, 24. There is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. That is about sticking with you all the time in adversity, not a fair with a friend, friend with you all the time. Proverbs 27, 9, oil and perfume make the heart glad, so a man's counsel is sweet to his friend. Oil heals, perfume refreshes. There's a wonderful scripture in Philemon, Will you turn it into Philemon chapter 2? Did you start turning to Philemon chapter 2 and you found what? Philemon doesn't have a chapter 2, it has only one chapter. Okay. Philemon, I just felt I've been a little mischievous. Philemon verse 7. Paul is speaking while he's writing to this gentleman, Philemon. He was a wealthy. Roman landowner and a slave owner and by writing to him Paul says we have great joy and consolation in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by your brother. So what does a friend do? Friend refreshes the heart. Say a friend refreshes the heart. You can be around him and you feel positive energy coming. So you need to have at least seven of those people because the world is also full of people who drain your energy because they are in need. Needy people touch you, virtue departs. That's part of Christian life. You remember that lady with the issue of blood when she touched Jesus? Jesus said, who touched me? Peter said, Master, you should be knowing this. So many people are pressing on you. You are asking who touched you? Who wants to touch you? It's just that they are. Then Jesus said, no, someone touched me in need because I felt virtue leaving me and she said, I was healed. So there are many people with need who will drain you. So you need people with refreshing energy, life. So that we are together in this in the church family that we refresh each other and the world touches us and they get healed. Amen. So we have to be friends to each other who refresh each other. Now I want to go to this passage of scripture in 1 Corinthians 13 right now to get this principle. Do I speak with tongues of men and angels and have not love? I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Now we belong to a persuasion of Christianity that we believe in the Holy Spirit. But at the benediction we say, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. So fellowship of the Holy Spirit is one third of Christianity. Now the Pentecostal fraternity 
has tried to substitute the Holy Spirit for everything. So we say, when we are, we are, when we are not sure, we might say, I am waiting for the Holy Spirit to lead me. One third. One third of the leading comes from Holy Spirit. One third comes from the love of God, the Father shed abroad in the hearts of your friends. Got it? One third comes from just being gracious to each other, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, gracious to each other when the other is in sorrow. Do you realize how leading comes? So we can't get so spiritualized as if we don't have a body. We have a body. We have a physical body and we have the body of Christ. So Paul is addressing the issue in 1 Corinthians 13 and telling them, Every problem is not solved by speaking tongues. Every problem is not solved by being uh, desiring the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You can have all of the nine of gifts of the Holy Spirit, one third of Christianity. Did you get that? We have to remind ourselves that we belong to a fraternity because we are five star Pentecostal. We can think Holy Spirit does everything. The other thing is wrong. Touch your head and say wrong thinking. Immediately 1 Corinthians 13 goes on to say, And although I have the gift of prophecy, understand all mysteries, all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I can remove mountains. And anyone knows, if you want a mountain removed, go to a Pentecostal church. Mountains get removed, but person can't remain the same, mountains will come again. External mountains will come again. So, one third Holy Spirit, one third grace. One third love and grace and love we practice on each other. That's why we need each other, isn't it? Grace and love we practice on each other. Grace means nothing. Grace is a tremendous doctrine. Imagine if we try to preach grace to empty chairs. Grace needs people. Love needs people. Moment you say grace, it means people. Moment you say love, it means people. No point exalting the virtue of love. Unless you are connected to people to whom your love is flowing and you are receiving. A few more Proverbs. Proverbs 27 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the pieces of an enemy. So the ideal friend will, will, will be, you know, if you have a if you have an abscess, abscess full of pus, the friend will bring, if he doesn't have a scalpel, he will at least will bring a delicata and prick it and you feel relieved. You understand? So the wounds of a friend meaning, the friend will tell you, friend, this is your problem and tell you the truth. You know what a wound of a friend is? You don't like to hear it. And but he tells you the truth. So we like the wounds of a friend. A friend who tells you the truth, though it is unpalatable. Did you understand? That's the mood of a friend. The truth that will heal you. Finally, from the Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. So we are together in the Lord Jesus Christ to sharpen the best in us. You know, when there's corrosion, when we get blunt, sharpening one another that's also part of friendship we are together to improve each other that's a bit of a snapshot view of the good things the proverb says about uh, friendships now from proverbs we are going to the next book was the book after proverbs yes ecclesiastes Ecclesiastes is a book on Solomon's meanderings and wanderings. Solomon was the wisest man on earth, but after 700 wives and 300 concubines, he was otherwise. Expect to visit it. He was otherwise. So he, he rambled, but thankfully God got hold of him. At the end of Ecclesiastes, I want to assure you, Solomon came back to sanity and faith. So how does Ecclesiastes end? Ecclesiastes chapter 
12, 13, and 14.